All right, Ruben. Thank you so much for joining me on the More Equity podcast. Um, for those of you who don't know, Ruben is the founder and CEO of Career Karma. I will let him do his own introduction because he will do it more justice than myself, but he's a very impressive man who has gone very far in his career. And so would love to kick it over to you to tell us a bit more about your background and career karma. Yeah, so I'm the, um, I, was, I was born in California, grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. I moved to Silicon Valley in 2014. Um, started a company in 2018 called Career Karma. And I'm the co-founder CEO of Career Karma. And what we do is we provide career navigation technology for people that are exploring more growth in their career. Um, and we started off by helping people uh, making a transition into technology jobs. Um, what we learned quickly is that matching people to a training program isn't enough. And so we offer three pillars to people, which is a coach, a roadmap, and a community. And what a lot of people often don't realize is that it's not just about helping people become a software engineer, for example, or a cybersecurity a professional, is helping them understand why they want to do this. So you know, at, at the core, our purpose is to help people discover their purpose and align their work to it. And we now have about a million people a month that come to us looking for career advice. Um, through that process, uh, we raised $52 million starting by uh, getting into Y Combinator. Actually, before Y Combinator, we raised a pre-seed, did Y Combinator winter 2019. Um, and now we're working with employers like Google that are seeking to invest in talent. Uh, so, so we work a lot with HR professionals that are focused on talent development. Um, we, we provide career navigation technology for managers and their direct reports, provide career guidance for all employees uh, and their individuals' careers while, ma while meeting the, the business objectives. Love it. Okay, fantastic. And of course, this uh, season on our podcast is Media Masterminds. You yourself have utilized media in your career in various different ways and was a pivotal part of actually starting Career Karma that we'll get into. But you yourself have over 100K followers across platforms, so have quite the audience um, and clearly are very active on media. So want to hear all your tips and tricks. But my my first question for you is, it seems like early in your career, you saw media as a strategy to open doors for yourself in a way that you couldn't do without media. And so I'm curious, pre-career karma, like we're going way back. How did you utilize Twitter to further your career? And how did you think to do that? Yeah, so so I never intentionally um, wanted to use social media as a strategy. It was more of something, I took a, I took a music history class, um, focus on philosophs. Uh, it was, and, and they talked about philosophers as social reformers. So I actually had a blog called The Social Reformer and I started writing long pieces with my buddy Adam Womack, but then I didn't have enough time because I was doing a double major at the time in business administration and music. And um, there was a blog called Posturist that was actually started by Gary Tan, by the way. And I actually became an early user on Twitter before celebrities were on it. And so I used Posturist and Twitter essentially to just share my thoughts. And I saw it less as a branding strategy and more of a public journal or a public accounting of history or citizen journalism, if you will, which quickly transformed into something that I do every single day that has led to a lot of opportunities. Now that I am an entrepreneur, I do think about it more strategically where we live in a world that is increasingly more and more connected uh, because of the internet. And um, because of that, it's hard to find things that are aligned with what you care about. And so one of the best ways to find people or things or activities that are aligned with what you care about is by you speaking publicly about it yourself. And by speaking publicly about what you care about, the people that 
also care about that will find you. And so the the last thing that I'll say is um, when I first moved to Silicon Valley, a lot of people would say every company is a media company. And so, you know, when I first came out, the people like I, I got connected through Balaji, who was at Andreessen Horowitz. So they have a great media strategy. And just like you guys, right, Harlem is now doing a podcast. And why do they do that? They do that to show that to entrepreneurs that they are very well connected. They have the best insights. They care about founders um, and so on and so forth. And so, oh, wow, Harlem's really cool. Um, I didn't know that they're connected to all these people. And same thing, even if you're looking for a career, um, people aren't going to really use it look at your resume, they're going to Google your name. And so whatever pops up online is what represents you. And if what represents you has nothing to do with the career that you're looking for, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think that you're putting yourself at a disadvantage. Totally. And I think one thing as well is that media gives people a false sense of closeness with you, right? In the sense that if I I Google you, I feel like I know Ruben, right? This is the first time we're meeting, but I feel like I I have your backstory. I know what you like. I know what you're going after, right? So we're having this conversation. I already feel like we have a deeper conversation that will happen than if I didn't know that you had a media presence, right? Uh, so. Absolutely. And, and related to that, you know, that level of familiarity that you already have, even though we're meeting for the first time, or uh, and it's, 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 um, that's intentional, right? So in order for me, it's almost selfish. It's right. In order for me to have a richer conversation with people, I actually don't want to repeat myself over and over and over again about my backstory. You can just find it. And then we can actually build from there, which is awesome. Like you could read years of my life in like an hour or less. All right, so. Totally, totally. So I guess going back to, to the early days when you started using media as a, a citizen's journal, as you call it, it's one thing to publish online and put your thoughts out there and build build sort of that presence, but it's another to cultivate relationships through media, right? It's two very different skills, in my opinion, and they don't go hand in hand necessarily, right? And so how did you utilize media and really make them into meaningful connections that helped you on your path? Yeah. Um, it's interesting because one of the most awesome things that I saw on Twitter when I first joined, and I know it's X now, but one of the first things that I saw was the fact that you can send a message to anybody, no matter how big they are or how small they are, or how famous they are publicly or privately. And it's okay if they ignore it, but they will see the message. And so... What I started to do as I started documenting my journey, I would jump into people's public conversations, all right? Leave a comment on their picture, leave a comment on their status, leave a, leave a comment on the video, right? Those things turn into familiarity to the other person because let's say that I'm always putting out thoughts and there's always a consistent individual that is replying and not just replying with, unproductive conversation, but adds to the conversation. It makes the conversation richer. That's, that's big. I'm going to pay, I'm going to notice that. I'm like, who is that individual? Then I'm going to look at your bar and I'm going to read your history. And what's, what's awesome is taking it to the next level where you go into a DM. And so, you know, at least on Twitter, Twitter is very different than like a Instagram or TikTok where if you DM, most often it's going to be something extremely professional trying to meet up for coffee or raise money or talk about a pitch deck or something like that. Um, and that's actually what happened with biology. I was tweeting him. I was, I was talking about education. I was talking about, you know, Bitcoin and things like that. And he sent me a DM. He did. And I was like, wow, this is a big dude sending me a DM. And he said, Hey, we, what's your background? We should get you into tech. And, and I responded and then he immediately added me on LinkedIn. He did. And I was like, well, who is this guy? All right. Then I saw how this was before he, this, he had less than a thousand followers at the top. And now he's like, wow, this is you, right? 
Yeah, and so, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so it's, it's, but like, it's really cool because you can find these people that, you know, are going to be that no matter how, where they are in life. And a lot of times they'll respond to you with a well-crafted message, but you have to make sure that you have a well-crafted message. And ideally you haven't asked. And uh, uh, the last thing that I'll say is you don't want to ask for what you want. You just want to ask for advice. It's the famous quote around like, if you, if you want advice, ask for money. If you want money, ask for advice. It's the same thing with the job, same thing with the career. But the key is, is if you get advice, do it and then tell them that you did it. The The worst thing is wasting people's time. They give you advice and then you don't do anything with it. Totally, totally. I I really love the engage with them often before going sort of the private message route because I I agree with you, right? It's like, and I'm sure you feel similarly where it's like, we have a big audience, but the people who consistently comment or like or are just around the conversations that you want to have, you know them, right? Like I can name probably the top 10 people who engage with my content the most. And if they sent me a DM, I would probably answer because I would feel like we have a relationship, right? And so, but uh, that that's uh, that's amazing. So I want to flip now to the career karma uh, aspect of things, right? And I think the the origin story of career karma is fascinating, right? And very heavily weighted in media. So it started with a podcast that you started on breaking into startups, right? And so I guess the question there was, when you started that podcast, what was the intention? Was it, did you think that you were going to build a business? And I guess like the the next question to that is, how did you build that audience? Yeah. So it's interesting because it's also rooted in that original blog that I was telling you about. So I started off with the social reformer. I went to Posturist. Posturist got acquired by Twitter. So I actually had an indirect relationship to Gary Tan before he even joined on our board when I was college. And he didn't even, we didn't even know each other, which is also pretty crazy. Um, what's interesting is I switched from Posturist to like Ruben Harris blog. And then it was called a how to guide. And then, um, and then at, on my blog, I actually documented how I got into investment banking and I, and I like broke it down the process of like all the reasons why someone like me wouldn't get hired in investment banking, but I told the world I'm going to do this. And so through the process of documenting the story of becoming an investment banker and I named, I, I posted that I got the job at BMO Capital Markets and the Fukushima Retail Group that actually led to 7,000 people sending me messages asking how to get into investment banking, actually. And so I actually helped a lot of people get into investment banking um, that are still working banking today at Deutsche Bank and other places like that, uh, Goldman. And that the course that I took to get into investment banking was called Breaking Into Wall Street, actually. And so from Merchant Inquisition. So when I moved to Silicon Valley, uh, I kept the same practice of, hey, Twitter's for short form writing, all the stuff that we described blogs are for long form writing. Like I want to document my journey because I love biographies. I love stories of people. And a lot of times you have to wait until they did something to read it. And so I wanted to, I was like the, 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 the process of building a billion dollar company has never been documented from a media perspective. And in, in the beginning, it wasn't really focused on building a company. It was just like, let me tell my story. Um, and my co-founders were doing boot camps at the time. And so while we were in boot camps, we were very frustrated and we were, a boot camp is a boot camp is hard. And we're like, wow, what if we heard stories, not of CEOs and VCs, that's what everybody talks about in the media. What if we heard stories of people going through boot camp to motivate us or people that went through transitions, like trying to get into investment banking with a not traditional background, that would be super cool. And so, uh, we created that podcast, Breaking Stars, like you said, that reached millions of people. Um, the original blog post got tweeted by like Mark Andreessen and Chris Dixon and all these other people. And then that led to our first school saying, Hey, we want to pay you $5,000 a month to advertise on your podcast. And we're like, Oh, that's 60,000 a year. Is this what schools do? Do schools pay for qualified applicants or to get enrollments and students into their programs? Um, and then, and then we discovered that that is the case. 
How big was your audience at the time the school reached out? Not very big. Um, before we launched, we started, um, we had, we had 30 episodes that we recorded. Um, but we intentionally focused on boot camp graduates, but also, um, the schools that we went through. So the first school was the one that my co-founder Archer graduated from. It was Hack Reactor. Uh, so, uh, Sean Dross. So he was, he was the first one. I think part of it was more like, Hey, big or small, at least they're reaching our people. Let's see what we can do and test it out. So that's. Got it. Okay. And so I'm curious now, or sort of the evolution of media for career karma, right? Obviously huge factor in starting it or the reason for starting it, right? How long did you keep that podcast going after launching the company? Yeah. So we launched the podcast. That's actually how I met Gary Chan in person was the podcast. Actually, I met, so Kim, my Cutler, this was before initialized capital existed. Um, so Kim, my Cutler was a reporter at TechCrunch. She set me up with, um, Matt Pazzarino, who was the editor in chief at TechCrunch. So I actually dropped the first few podcasts, um, during black history month, actually, um, and so it was like all black people from different backgrounds on the homepage of TechCrunch, um, which led to him um, making an intro to Alexis Ohaney. And I actually wanted to interview Alexis. I didn't know who Gary Tanner was actually at the time. Um, and then she, um, we got the interview set up with Alexis Ohaney. Um, this is even before he was married to Serena. Like it's, it's how early it was. And then that, when he jo came for the interview, he was like, "Hey, I brought a friend with me. His name is Gary Tan. We're gonna interview both of us." I was like, "All right, cool." So like that. So like that. So like that's how I met Gary and Alexis. And then after I sat down with Gary, we started talking about the podcast, and we he started like giving advice on how to think about the fact that people are coming to us looking for guidance and how to turn it into a big business. Um, in addition, and like the podcast and organizing events led to me meeting Michael Seibel and people like that, that were critical to our journey. Um, but like you said, media events, relationships, all are what led to uh, getting to this point. Do you still have the podcast running? I had the podcast running all the way until series a yeah so okay, we, we, we had a. we had we had um marcelo from softbank uh who's, he started his own thing now bicycle um he he was on our podcast i think that's the last episode that we've done it doesn't not still exist it's still there if we want to do something with it um i would say at this point breaking into startups is still important but we're learning that workforce development is a lot bigger than startups. And there's a lot of people within startups and within companies that want to grow in their career. And so we have to evolve on the podcast. And so I do have an idea for a new show that I will drop when I'm ready. But that's probably not going to happen for another year or two. Okay. I'm excited to I'm excited to hear. I was like, did we get the first sneak peek on this on this podcast? Um, so I guess th this leads into my next question, which is, how did your media strategy change over time for career karma? Right? It seems like the podcast was serving a purpose for career karma up until the Series A, right? And how do you think about it now relative to then? I would say it served a purpose through seed or pre-seed, um, and we continued doing it still out of love, right? It was less about, hey, we need this for the business. Um, but it showed us the importance of content. And so something that we doubled down on was SEO, SEM. And so for the people that don't know that search engine optimization and search engine marketing, SEO is organic, SEM is paid marketing. And so we optimize on SEO, which is organic marketing. Thing about organic marketing is it's like bamboo. You got to plant seeds that 
you know, probably won't take eight. It'll probably take like 18, 24, maybe even 36 months to start seeing the benefits of it. So you got to invest and take care and nurture this content before you actually see any significant levels of traffic. And then you're also at the mercy of like a Google changing its algorithm. So you always got to monitor how your content is performing from a keyword perspective to make sure that you're ranking at the top for everything. And so that was, that was something that we uh, focused on and we're still focused on with that said, you know, AI is changing the whole world. Right. And so, you know, I can go very deep into the AI subject, but I will say, um, related to this, I am a thousand percent confident that the way we search for things is going to change. And so I have to be aware of that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's an interesting note for sure. Um, but in the way that we search for things now, I agree with you. SEO is very important. And we always tell our founders, your company name is actually quite important when it comes to SEO, right? Like if you use a common word, it's going to be really hard to get that that Google search up, right? And the last thing you want is for somebody not to be able to find you, right? So I guess in your level of priorities, where does SEO sit? You're still high up there. I would say as we are thinking about the next five years, it's important. But what's more important is our perspective on the future, All right? So... If we think about the last five years, we've been a human service supported by product. The next five years are going to be a product-driven service supported by humans. And so while we give people a coach, a roadmap, and a community, if I'm working with a large retail company, for example, that I'm talking to that has 20,000 people in their corporate roles and 100,000 people in their stores, how can you really scale something with humans? to serve and provide career development for all of them, giving them a coach, a roadmap, and a community. Even if you do that well, and you have the resources to do that, that's going to cost you tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars just to maintain a staff of coaches. And even then, let's pretend that you had some kind of product-driven way to be mindful of what the coaches are doing and so on and so forth. That's still only one company, right? And you want if you want to close the entire Fortune 1000, which is a lot of companies, and that's that's just a sliver of the amount of companies that exist in the world. It is impossible to do that without product. And so, um, as we think about that product-driven service that's supported by humans, I am really focused on th- what I believe that. I wouldn't say few people believe um, because that's a peer to your question, which is like, what do you believe that very few people believe or that, or what truth do you believe that very few people or nobody agrees with you on? I would say I have a non-controversial opinion about talent development that I don't think anybody would disagree with me on. And I, I want to really flesh that out um, before I start doubling down on content and share that opinion with the world. But I mean, I could show you high level what I think. Yeah. So so I'm curious as obviously a CEO of a business, I think there's there's an arc, right? And we're, we're, I'm, I'm uh, going off path here a bit, but there's an arc to being a CEO, right? And so at some point you have to start making your own decisions and getting people on board with it instead of having sort of a unanimous vote oh, within man. the company, yeah. right? And so I was just talking to a portfolio company yesterday about this, right? Where it's like they're transitioning into the, this is what has to get done next year. And this is what we're going to do instead of it being like, everybody might not agree. So just out, you know, sort of left field, just curious based on what you said, how do you think about having sort of the conviction that you do in your own ideas while also taking feedback from others around you? Yeah. So there's, there's a really good video by Michael Seibel was with YC about how to build product that talks a lot about um, going through the debates with your founders or with the team and welcoming that and embracing that and taking however long it takes to align but not be aligned, right? So it's like, you're gonna you're not going to be aligned on everything. 
and being comfortable that like your idea might not get chosen, but also recognizing that like if you time box these decisions, like they can play out one way or another. And then the next time you have your planning meeting, which shouldn't be very far from now, maybe it's like two weeks later or a month later or a week later, your idea might come up again in the next conversation. But like always be shipping is like super important and always be trying new things is going to be very important. And like creating the space to have those debates where you're, where you're, where there might be that friction. With that said, um, the problem with, let's just call it like a distributed company, right? Versus like everyone being in an office or even everyone being in an office is like, in order to have these debates about the direction of the company strategically or about product development or something like that, um, is a lot of times you're missing the context to be able to provide any feedback. So for example, if you're working on product development, but you've never listened to any calls that I've had with the HR leader in enterprise, you might know a lot about the employee experience or the career transitioner because that's what we do on our consumer side of the app. But if you're not in the, the mindset of the buyer who ultimately is the person that is the customer, they're not going to renew because they don't see the value. And the only person that sees the value is the employee, which is important. It's not the only, right? And so um, there's a lot of other scenarios, but I'll say the context matters. So like when you're having these conversations, sometimes lack of context is also beneficial, right? Because like you have this naivety to something and you have a fresh thinking to something where, you know, sometimes being too deep into something biases you towards certain ideologies and mindsets. And so you want to be welcoming um, different things. But if it's me, in my opinion, I'll say the founder matters a lot. The founders matter a lot. And that's why they're the visionaries. Totally. So it's like take in everything around you, have context for everything, make sure you're well informed, and then make your decision from there. And have to get the the team on board, right? It's, it's it's also a selling point, I guess, for founders, right? Where it's like you might not trust this, but this is the direction we're going. Um, yeah, it's like I mean, imagine if you're like in a conversation with Elon, and he's like, "Yo, we need to create reusable rockets, and we got to slash space costs by ninety percent." They're like, "All right, Elon, I could definitely get you a reusable rocket, but slashing space costs by ninety percent." I don't think I could do that. He'd be like, all right, well, find somewhere else. You can go to Blue Origin. Like, and, and no, 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 shade, no yeah. shade to them, but it's more of like, that's what I'm not budging on. That's what I want. So like, I want to provide career navigation for all employees at an affordable price while meeting business objectives. And I want to do it in a product-driven way. And I want to be able to give the C-suite a pulse of progress on everything that the employees want. And I want them to be in a position where they can do something to support them. Sit. Less than hundred dollars a month. That's what I want. Okay. Let's go. Gonna Let's do figure it. Figure it out. Right. Gonna do it. If you don't so, believe in it, <laughs> that's okay. Go. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not a, it's not a, it's not an argument. It's not a fight. It's more like, all right, we're not out of line. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We actually just had our founder summit and we had um a very experienced founder as our panelist for for one uh, session. And he basically was saying, related to hiring, he's very straight from the beginning. He says, this is what the job is. This is the vision you have to buy into. These are the hours you have to work. And it's totally okay if you don't want to do that, but you could get paid more and have a better lifestyle somewhere else. And so you either want it or you don't, and it's okay if you don't, but I'm going to lay it all out. And he was, he was very adamant about that. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's very important. It's very important. Like, I think early on, you know, I optimize a lot for people that have done the work or that can do the work or that, you know, came from the right place and blah, blah. But I think what you just described is probably the most important, like, especially like, like, I like, I like obsession. I like people that are obsessed with the problem or obsessed with the vision where they're always dreaming, always thinking, always trying to figure out how to take it to the next level and to serve people. 
because I know what I'm working on is inevitable. Somebody's going to figure it out. Right. It's like, it's, it's, I, and I always bet on the inevitable. It's like, you, you see the big debates about what's happening right now with, let's just call it AI. Right. And, you know, whether you're EA or whether you're EACC, right. For the people that don't know, there's effective altruism versus effective acceleration. That's like, and, and if you don't even know what that means, it's more of like, are you, you know, D cell or XL, right. Which is like, are you for the camp of, Hey, slow down, slow down before we get to AGI or let's get to AGI as fast as possible. For the people that don't know what AGI is, it's, artificial general intelligence, which is pretty much the ability to complete human tasks, right? Like technology can complete human tasks, right? And so a lot of people are scared of that. But what I just say, it's inevitable. If we don't do it, somebody's going to do it. Right? <laughs> like that's a, that's a fact, right? And so if that's going to happen, then you need to operate accordingly and figure out, okay, cool. If I have some kind of technology that can operate as the same level as a human, how are my coaches going to be supported? Or do I need coaches? Or how do my managers have support, right? So these are all like questions you got to ask and you got to execute accordingly. If GPT-4 is primitive technology, if this is 56K internet in this Napster moment or this AI, this 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 technology moment. Yeah. <laughs> then you better get to moving. Yeah. As a yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I like I like the example <laughs> of, you know, you did invest in banking. I I likewise did invest in banking. And it's funny because there's the example out there related to sort of getting to AGI. It's like we didn't have Excel, you know, 30 years ago, yet bankers still work the same amount of hours. We have Excel, we have Cap IQ, we have PitchBook, we have every single thing that we need to make this job easier, and bankers still work the same amount of hours. So there will be more tasks for humans. I think it's just for a matter sure. of what those tasks look like are going to inevitably evolve. For sure. I mean, just think, I mean, just my, my dad likes to say artificial intelligence is an intelligence because the definition of intelligence is the application of knowledge, right? So even if you have an all-knowing thing, you got to apply that human or human like thing to doing whatever it is that you want to do. And we all know humans have challenges doing things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. do you think that the, the, the artificial version of that is going to have challenges doing things and it's not going to need guidance? It will just like people do. Yeah, totally, totally, totally. Okay. I'm going to take, take us back to sort of, the, the media train. Um, and I'm curious as a founder who obviously has raised significant capital, I'm curious your view on the intersection of media and fundraising. Do you think that it helped your fundraising efforts? Did it hinder them in any way? And maybe it changes by round. I'm not sure. Well, it helps. I mean, I've I raised a lot of capital just through Twitter DMs because people can see what I tweet about. So you now I've, I've called DM people that have, I mean, I'm talking about millions of dollars just through sending messages online to people that I never met before and talking to them. And they don't always tell me specifically that what they saw on Twitter is why they follow me. I, I get a lot more actually reactions through to LinkedIn now, actually, because I've, I've been treating LinkedIn kind of like Instagram where I just post what I think. Yeah, I like <laughs> or that. Or what I feel. Because like and you and you're starting to even see a lot of public companies CEOs post pictures of them and their family. It's like we're moving you know, you hear a lot of people talk about work life balance or work life integration or like I like the word work work life harmony, right? Or it's just like they if if people work for a company, they want to know what the leader is personally like, right? So so it's, it's not just me interviewing you for a job or the investor looking at the founder for a job. The founder is also going to look at the investor and see what they're about, right? I know that Harlem Capital has a lot of former investment bankers or finance people. I know that. I knew that before. It's not just black people. You guys are very finance driven and oriented, like which is great, 
awesome lies with me, you know? Well, so this actually leads directly into my next question, which can be, I don't know, controversial. It's obviously a view, but it's, it definitely has very two different camps. But as a founder, what is your view on VC Twitter and investors that have a large media following? I think it's great. I think, think it's we, great. I think we need more of it. I think really yeah. okay. I think I think that what I what I'm what I'm less in favor of is groupthink, right? So the thing that's funny to me about tech people, especially VCs, is everybody claims that they're contrary, contrarian, but they're not. They're a bunch of followers. And they have no real conviction about anything. Like they, they literally have to know who else is in around to lead a deal. For example, that's not leadership. That's just being a follower. And if you said no before, and then you said yes because somebody else is in the round, you don't. You're not thinking for yourself. And so, when I say I need more of it, I'm saying I need more independent thinkers that aren't so. A lot of people talk about product market fit. I'm going to go back to the founder mindset. It's not about fitting into the market only, all right? It's about having a clear opinion about the future that you want to see, creating a product that fits into the current market and manifests the vision that you want to see. So when I'm seeking capital and an investor's talking to me, hey, like, when are you thinking about well, doing a Series C and this and that? You know, the first question I'm going to ask them is not what hits that they have, how much money they have under management, what's their average check. I'm going to ask, tell me what you think about what's going on in the HR talent development space. Mm. Yep. Where yep. do you think it's going? Like, what's your opinion? Okay, give me some examples of companies you've invested in that's in that direction. Okay. Oh, you haven't invested in those? Okay, cool. What companies are you following? Don't say us. Yeah. <laughs> I want to yeah. know. I want to know because I want I want to I want a thought partner. I don't want to just somebody that it's like it's like being in a relationship with somebody that just gives you money. That's not yeah. a real relationship. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, true. So do you do you sway when you pick your investors, which is obviously a big deal? Do you sway on the people who have the the name recognition or do you sway on the people who have given you the best responses to those questions? Um, both name recognition definitely matters. Um, but I would argue I have some, some investors that have given us over $20 million with one check that a lot of people have never heard of, you know? And it's because they responded to those questions well. Uh, yeah, that's part of it. That's part of it. So like another question that I ask you is, is less about your opinion, but like, how do you actually help founders? All right. So in this environment, when most founders are not raising money, most founders are not hiring, most founders are focused on execution, and while you can help them with marketing, most VCs, in order to help their founders outside of capital, are going to either help with marketing, help with hiring, which a lot of people are not going to be doing because they're decreasing their paid marketing spend. And they might help with portfolio introductions, which... It's cool, but every time I ask a found a VC, how do you help your portfolio companies? Zero of them. And I'm not talking about like, like historical. I'm talking about current investors that wanna invest in our next round. I say, zero of them say, I help my portfolio companies get customers. Like literally, that's like the, the the number one thing. If you help your portfolio company get customers, that means that they get more revenue, which increases your valuation of your investment. That's not, I just don't understand why that is so hard to do. Um, or like why it's not a natural thing. I don't think it's hard to, I think I've had people help me with that, but I have to ask. I don't understand why that's not just like the default. So that's just a lot of people's like, we're good to help you raise more money. It's like, I don't want to do that. Yeah. You're like, that's not the objective here. The objective is to raise money. less money. <laughs> <Exactly. Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Okay. A, a couple more questions for you. Um, 
To founders who are thinking about using media as a strategy, do you recommend focusing some percentage of their time on it or no? And does that depend on sort of the industry and the business that you're building? I think it should be done in any industry, but the homework is knowing your market better than anybody else, having a unique perspective and educating people on both of those things, the market and your perspective without talking about yourself and ideally highlighting the people or the things or the organizations that are aligned with that philosophy that you have. All right. So like, I'll give you an example, right. As I'm thinking about this new show, right. So with this new show, I've been thinking a lot about, um, you know, we have breaking into startups. And so, you know, up until this point, we've helped people from underestimated backgrounds transition into technology jobs. So I was like, man, breaking, how, how can I use the word breaking into something with the enterprise and Fortune 500 company? I was like, well, you know, there's this concept of breaking the glass ceiling for women, you know, but that doesn't sound like a cool podcast show, like breaking the glass ceiling podcast. It doesn't sound very cool, but like, but, but it is an invisible barrier. And I was like, who else got invisible barriers inside of company? Everybody. All right. So I was like, okay, cool. Well, how do I do something that's for the culture that's aligned with this ideology? And I was like, mm, there's a wise poet named Lil Wayne that has a mixtape. And, and he has a mixtape that I listened to growing up called No Ceilings. I was like, oh, yeah. No ceilings. That's hard. That's it. So, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. That's so st it. Stay tuned. <laughs> the, the, yeah. I was like sneak peek. Everybody's on their <laughs> on their toes. Oh my god, the, the wise poet Lil Wayne. Yeah. <laughs> Truly. Um, okay. <laughs> Two more questions for you. Who are your favorite follows right now? Favorite follows right now. Hmm. I have a list on Twitter called the A Team. So I'm I'm in a super 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 nerdy mode right now, and it's it's a chess mode. I'm like super into chess right now. Um, I'll tell you. So so the first person I thought about is a guy named Gotham Chess. All right. The reason why I think chess is fascinating is is I'm a I'm I'm into Duolingo. I think I think that's one of my favorite apps. But Chess.com is my second favorite app. Maybe it might be my first favorite app. And the reason why is because um, chess players, even up to the grass grandmaster level, accept that the machines are smarter than them. And rather than fight them, they train with them. So the best chess engine can beat Magnus Carlsen tomorrow, right? He's the greatest player in the world, right? But what's interesting is like nobody wants to watch two engines playing each other perfectly. That's boring. They want to watch the greatest pl human players play imperfectly and analyze their games, leveraging the machines. And so that app is fire. But going back to that follow, Gotham Chess is very interesting because he has a YouTube channel and he like comments on the games and it's hilarious and it's awesome and it's it's, a, it's like it feels like you're watching like a sports thing so like he's he's one of my favorite follows um in addition to a couple other coaches like robert ramirez and pontus carlson those are people but that's that's my my nerd one my tech one um, i don't really have a specific tech person i have i have a, a twitter list called the a team that i follow and that gives me a good, you know what I'm going to say? I'm going to say the All In Podcast. The reason why I like the All In Podcast is even though I don't agree with all the political views, I think they're doing a fantastic job of covering tech while also covering global events and political ideology with business quickly. So you always are aware of what's going on. Like even with everything going on with OpenAI, like Shamash just like 
drop this whole breakdown of the organizational structure. And it's just, this is very interesting how him, um, you know, Jason and David and the other guy, um, Brad, I think is his name, that they're all doing a great job um, with that show. Um, but like these guys are on Twitter. So the the third one, I'm going to say third one. I know you didn't ask me a third one. Third person that I think is everyone should study if you're thinking about media earn your leisure. Rashad and Troy are incredible. You don't know what earn your leisure is? No, I do. I do know earn your leisure. I just oh, didn't yeah, expect yeah, that yeah. to be your, your response. Oh, man. Earn your leisure. They, they got the playbook. Interesting. Like okay. what they're doing in financial literacy is the playbook for like any industry. All right. Love that. Love that. Love that. Okay. Last and final question, sort of a, out of left field, but you went to college to be a professional musician. So a man of very, very many talents and your cello teacher told you. Being the best musician in the world is an opinion, right? And you can spend your life doing that. And what a lot of artists tends to do is ignore business because they think that's going to interrupt their art. So rather than spending your whole life becoming the best musician in the world, master business, because what a lot of artists don't realize is when you get to a certain level of success, you are forced to learn business. That's why you see so many artists in messed up contracts. And if you focus on business first while maintaining your skill level as an artist, then you can fund yourself in music versus the people that get rich and try to um, get into art, but aren't artists themselves. They're just visitors, but they're not real. And no, no shade to them, but it's like, it's different when you're actually the artist, kind of like Steve Aoki, right? He comes from the Benny Hanna family, right? And so he just fund himself. It's yeah. Better way. Yeah. Better that way. So will you ever go back to music? I, I mean, I was practicing cello yesterday. You can look on my Instagram. I put it up. You know, I practice cello all the time. Um, I was doing something with my buddy Kevin Alusolo, Ling Ling Jr., Junior, Zaytoven, all these guys. So I'm very close with all the different artists. I still plan on winning a Grammy in the future, um, uh, 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 but not now. You know, we'll see. You know, I'll say like if DJ Khaled, you know, was like, "Hey, bro," like and he's in Miami too. He's like, "Hey, bro, you want to play on the track?" That's I could do that easy, no problem. Yeah. 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 Okay. I love it. I love it. Okay, Ruben. Well, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for, for joining me. Um, where can people find you? It's my name on everything. So Ruben Harris, R-U-B-E-N-H-A-R-R-I-S on Twitter, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, um, or my email, which is R-U-B-E-N at careercomma.com. Wow. We got the email in there. It's amazing. I love that. All right, Ruben, thank you so much. Very much appreciate it. Likewise. Thank you.